Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Center for Global Development and Georgetown um, Guide um, Future of Development Seminar. I'm Ronald Esmaiko, a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development, and I'm standing in for our usual host, Shant Shanta Devarajanan, who is traveling today. Um, the Future of Development Seminar takes um, big topics on uh, of ongoing importance for public welfare in low and middle, uh, low and middle income countries, and we invite um, outstanding scholars in the field to discuss them with us. And this sort of second season, as it were, is um, going back to our uh, original fully virtual setup. And we've got an amazing lineup of speakers um, on topics such as tax and public finance, uh, bureaucratic and state capacity lined up for you over the next few months. But the first um, of, um, edition of the second season is on another big topic, which is um, environmental and uh, uh, the environment and climate change, and specifically how local and global negative environmental externalities can be handled by uh, low and low in low and low middle income countries. And to talk us through this, we have two uh, amazing scholars who we're really lucky to have here. Um, first up, we'll have uh, Professor Seema Jayachandran who is a professor of economics and public affairs at Princeton University. And as our discussant, we have Professor Rohini uh, Seminathan, professor of economics in the Delhi School of Economics. Um, so the setup of the talk is that Seema will speak for about uh, 20 to 25 minutes, and uh, we'll then move to Rohini for some discussion comments. You can put questions in as we're going along into the Q&A function or into the chat. Um, but we'll use, we'll draw on them as we, uh, for a moderated discussion after both sets of comments. And um, with that, um, and an enormous thank you for, for, to both of you for your time, I'll uh, hand over to Seema. Thank you very much. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Renee, th and uh, I'm happy to be participating uh, in this terrific series. So I'm going to talk about the intersection of development and environment, and as Renee previewed, I'm going to zero in on not the effects of environmental degradation in low and middle income countries, but the challenge of protecting the environment. Okay, so, you know, there's a challenge and, and a need for smart public policy to protect the environment and internalize externalities everywhere in the world. Uh, so just in thinking about what makes this topic different in low and middle income countries and and um, I, what comes to mind for me are, are two things, both of which make it harder. One is that you know, often protecting the environment involves a trade-off with economic development. I'm not going to be very Pollyannish uh, about the, the nexus of these two topics. And so that trade-off uh, is, is often going to be harder. It's going to be asking more of people to sacrifice economic well-being to protect the environment uh, when the their basic needs are not met yet. So just this is a, really a point about diminishing marginal utility that the 10% lower income is just much more meaningful for someone who's very poor. And then the second challenge is, uh, is the ability to enact the policies in cases where you do want to protect the environment, the ability to enact effective policies. And, and they're just less well-developed state capacity governance challenges are important in uh, important barriers to environmental protection. Okay, so, you know, as I was putting together these slides, I realized that I think it's useful to think about different cases uh, because whether we should go forward and who should fund it are going to, to differ across these cases. And so I think one case is where there's a win-win of environmental protection and economic development domestically from the perspective of, of a low and middle income countries government, or you can also think about this from a subnational government's perspective. And so there the challenge is really, the task is really, how do you achieve that environmental protection? There's another case where there's gonna be a trade-off between protecting the environment and economic development from the low and middle income countries uh, point of view, but there can be a win-win or globally, or at least a win neutral where we can protect the environment without harming economic development. And here I'm mostly going to be talking about climate change mitigation. And then I think, you know, the hardest cases where, uh, you know, probably we aren't going to see much 
protection of the, of the environment in the short run are where you know, there's a trade-off domestically and it's not clear it's sort of an, uh, uh, an economic win for external funders to be funding it. And and so these are the cases where you know current people, politicians, citizens might, might be more impatient, have less care less about the far future than you know, uh, you know, may, some people might uh, want them to. Okay, so let me start with the the domestic win wins, and you know he, I'm calling this the easy case in the sense that this is a case where they're um, we're not thinking about a, a trade off uh, at a at, at the aggregate level, you know, and but nonetheless there's still going to be a need for public policy. This is just the econ 101 point that you know what. Is privately optimal for an individual. It's rarely going to be also be what's perfect for the environment. We have two different objectives. You know, the the likelihood that they align perfectly is is low. Uh, but you know, if those negative externalities to society are larger than the the private benefits, you know, a government should want to protect the environment. And we have many tools to align behavior so that we get that socially optimal outcome. We can ban the environmental damaging out, uh, activity. We could tax it, use market forces. We could turn that tax into a subsidy, uh, et cetera. And, and, you know, this is not a, I don't know how to kind of prove this or, or but I guess I, you know, just my my survey of, of thinking about these cases, I think probably a lot of these win-wins are going to be where there's health harm to human beings in the short run, you know, whether that's loss of life or reduced labor productivity, you know, and someone maybe in a longer horizon, lower human capital where kids are learning less in school. Those are cases where they're just very um, identifiable, important economic costs of environmental damage. I think a really important example of this in the world today is particulate matter, where there's just mounting evidence of its wide-ranging harms that are both wide-ranging and large, uh, and such that reducing particulate matter from current levels, probably everywhere in the world, but especially in low and middle-income countries where it tends to be high, that that's going to be uh, a win-win for, uh, for, for most low and middle-income countries. And so here I'm going to kind of do a deep dive into an example of a topic I've been thinking about for the past few years, which is crop residue burning in uh, North India. So crop residue burning, we're specifically looking at rice, where after you harvest rice, there's some residue. You can burn it to get rid of it so that you can reuse that field again. And anybody who's familiar with, with India knows that this is uh, one of the contributors to what's a major environmental and health challenge public health challenge in, in North India, which is the, the really high rate of, of air pollution in New Delhi. So, you know, the literature suggests that in North India overall, particulate matter reduces life expectancy by an enormous amount, six to nine years. You know, even whether it's that high or a little bit lower, it's still just a really important problem. Crop burning is not the only contributor to it, but in the winter, it's probably 30% of the, the cause. And so I think this is just an interesting case to think about of why has this problem persisted? And so the reason it's persisted is not that, yes, it's harmful for the environment, but you know, the economic benefits of keeping it going are, are even larger. This is not about, this is not an efficient outcome by any stretch of the imagination. It's just a classic case where an individual farmer, the cheapest option for them to clear their field is to burn it. You can rent equipment to manage this residue without burning, but you have to pay some private costs. And they're 1,000 to 3,000 rupees, which is 13 to $38 per acre. That's after some subsidies. That's you know, a reasonable share of profits. And so it's, and it's much uh, more expensive than burning. We can just do a very simple back of the envelope calculation of what is the mortality cost of that activity that farmers are engaging in it's 170 to 500 times the farmer's cost. This is just taking data on how many lives lost or attributed to this using the Indian government's value of a statistical life, et cetera. So it's about $6,400 per acre as the mortality cost. That's more than the revenues from an acre of, of harvesting, of growing uh, rice. And so that's just even one component there, you know, also causes asthma, other morbidity, heart attacks, reduces labor productivity, contributes to, to climate change, though the climate change costs are 
you know, probably a hundred times smaller than the, the particulate matter costs. So this is just clearly a case where you'd want to solve it from the domestic perspective. When the government has tried to, to make progress on this, so first of all, by making it illegal. So it's illegal to, or was illegal to, to burn residue, yeah, but there's limited enforcement of this. And I'll come on the next slide to, you know, why do I, what's going on here? You know, the government also, this central government also allocated money to states to subsidize the equipment, a particular kind of equipment where you incorporate it into the soil, but it's not a full subsidy. So it's still cheaper for the farmer to burn. And what was subsidized was not the preferred way of managing the stubble for farmers, which is removing it from the fields and bailing it into uh, using balers. And so as a result, you know, the, there's been some policy efforts, but the problem is still widespread. There's not a lot of evidence that it's decreased uh, since, you know, may, maybe this stronger policy push uh, eight to 10 years ago. And so what's going on as, you know, why isn't this working? And here I'm both talking about the specific case and also just trying to think through what's, you know, kind of a list of some of the challenges for uh, enacting effective policy, even when it seems like, even when you're convinced uh, domestically that you should solve this problem. So a part of it is weak state capacity to enforce regulations, or in this case, the ban. So part of it is political will, given that much of the damage is in other jurisdictions. So, you know, a central government, a, a center might want to internalize this, but if a lot of the regulatory enforcement uh, is at the state level, then you have some cross-jurisdictional challenges there of actually wanting to hurt your citizens by fining them when the benefits are going to be in, say, New Delhi. It's also just bureaucratic efficiency of just the balking and tackling of, of uh, enacting this regulation and enforcing it. And, you know, in some cases, there's corruption that might um, prevent it from being properly enforced. I think, I don't know how widespread this is across all low- and middle-income countries, but I think there's also maybe, a, you know, a, uh, lack of imagination about the different policy instruments we can use and, you know, kind of a tendency to want the polluter to bear the costs of, of the polluter to pay, to polluter to bear the costs, even though, you know, in this case, the polluter, a farmer in the state of Punjab might be uh, poorer than some of the beneficiaries of stopping that behavior who you know, might be in, in New Delhi. I think it's a low information environment and that, you know, there's low information on various pieces. Monitoring activity is hard or expensive. Uh, in this case, you know, one of the things is knowledge that's important is knowledge of what farmers, how they want to manage a stubble. And if you don't have good information about that, you're going to pick the wrong policy solution. I think part of coming back to, you know, cross-jurisdictional, part of it is, is, is it would be wonderful to have better state capacity for taxation because, you know, if we, fine people, that's a revenue source, but often it's gonna make more sense to have a subsidy to people to prevent it or compensate them for uh, having to not engage in that environmental damaging activity, but then you need to raise the revenue somewhere for that. And so, you know, kind of taxation uh, is, is just an important lever to be able to have efficient policies. And then probably, you know, the health harms of particulate matter aren't as widely appreciated by citizens since part of the push for action comes from citizens realizing, hey, this is really bad for us. We would like, we're going to um, put pressure on a government to, to solve this. So I'll just briefly mention a study uh, that I've been working on with uh, several other people where we trialed payments for ecosystem services, which is the idea of paying people to avoid an environmentally damaging activity. And we paid, offered people 800 rupees per acre. It wasn't the entire cost, probably should have been higher, you know, we kind of proposed 2000 rupees per acre, but this is making progress and trying to change the financial calculus for farmers and so that they're willing to uh, avoid burning. So compared to finding people, it's giving them a reward. Uh, and so that's more politically palatable to enforce. And compared to subsidizing equipment, we're rewarding the outcome of not burning and farmers can choose however they'd like to achieve that, you know, the currently subsidized equipment, balers, et cetera. And then, you know, in principle, if you could tax uh, and, and, you know, tax people who are beneficiaries, you could raise the money internally to fund this. In this case, this was funded from external donor money. You know, one thing we 
we kind of were motivated. I think PES makes a lot of sense in when the people who are doing environmentally damaging activities are poor. Uh, and so they're appropriate in low and middle income countries, but you know, some features of, of the standard contract might also limit their effectiveness. In particular, you know, you're usually sort of paying people after you verified they did the environmentally correct thing. Uh, but if there's some credit constraints, so they need money to be able to do that, you're in a chicken and egg problem. And you know, they might not trust that you're going to pay them. So in this study, we tried out moving some of the money up front. So unconditionally giving some of the money and then paying the balance as a conditional reward for, for not burning. So in brief, what we found is that the standard PES didn't work at all. So, you know, sometimes kind of the textbook policies uh, don't work. Uh, but when we pay, put some of the money up front, we reduced burning in this case by uh, about 11 percentage points. There's 11 percentage points less burning. This is uh, showing you not being burned. So higher is better. So it didn't completely solve the problem. Like I mentioned, probably you need to pay people more so that it's actually in more people's personal interest not to burn, but you can make progress this way, I, you know, arguably more progress than is made with the other policies in place. So, you know, coming back to what do I think is most needed to solve these easy cases? It's probably, you know, I, it's not actually an area I work on, but I, I have come around to the view that, you know, stronger state capacity and government governance and the ability to regulate is the single biggest challenge for a lot of these uh, environmental problems. I think in some cases, access to cheaper capital is important. You know, in this context of crop burning, maybe one of the solutions is to have more demand for the stubble by having biogas plants or other commercial uses of it. And so they're you know, one of the constraints to this happening um, just sort of naturally within India is probably some high cost of capital. Okay, let me pivot to the the cases that I think are a, you know, a domestic trade-off, but a global win-win. And uh, here I'm really going to focus on climate change. So I think there's, a, I think we all know there's an enormous global need to mitigate climate change. Poor countries are going to be the hardest hit, and it's going to be expensive. Uh, you know, there's an estimated $2 trillion for climate change mitigation financing needs in low and middle income countries per year, excluding China. And, you know, those benefits of that mitigation are global. And so many projects that make sense globally are not going to have a benefit cost ratio less than one if you use a strictly domestic perspective. You know, if you think like in the US under the Trump administration, when the social cost of capital went from thinking about global benefits to domestic benefits, that was like uh, you know, one seventh the the social cost of, of capital. And the US is a, is a large country. So uh, you know, this is what makes sense globally is not going to necessarily make sense domestically. I think there's a, you know, a very, to me, <laughs> you know, this is a very clear case that, uh, you know, poor countries are to blame for the problem. Paying to solve it would impose the largest hardship in terms of that trade-off of economic development and uh, doing what's good in, for the environment. And so rich countries, you know, should be funding most of the climate change, if not all of the climate change mitigation that the world needs. And so I think, you know, the, the, Point I want to make here is that I think not enough dis not enough emphasis is made uh, on the point that who pays you know need not coincide with where the mitigation takes place you know and it's a truly global problem that's part of why it's so hard to solve but that global nature is also an opportunity you know, we can reduce a ton of CO two in India or Uganda and that's as good for people in the U S as if we reduce it in the U S. And so that means, you know, anybody thinking about this and thinking about efficiently mitigating climate change, getting the most for a given budget should not be putting in an artificial uh, constraint of I'm only going to look within my borders. We should be looking globally. And many of the lowest cost options are going to be in low and middle income countries. And this is an argument that Rachel Glenister and I have laid out in a recent Journal of Economic Perspectives article. Um, you know, why are... A lot of the inexpensive ways to mitigate climate change in low and middle income countries, you know, the many of you are probably familiar with this what a, this depiction on the left of a marginal uh, abatement cost curve, which is there are many ways we can achieve the same goal of having less CO2 or other greenhouse gases emitted. They're going to differ in their costs. 
you know, and we should pursue them from cheapest to, to, to most expensive. You know, and, and why are there a lot of the cheap ones, the ones on the left in low and middle income countries? Partly it's about willingness to pay. If like we're making, citizens are making sacrifices, governments are putting in money to help this global problem. The, you know, citizen, uh, rich country governments might be willing to tax citizens, hurt, you know, raise taxes, spend money uh, at, at fund projects that are costlier than a low and middle income country has been willing to do, understandably. And then, you know, some of these opportunities are negative costs, meaning, you know, like switching from incandescent light bulbs to LEDs. You know, why have some of those uh, win-wins not been taken up in, in especially in poorer countries. Some of them are capital intensive. They're win-wins if you invest today and then in the long run, you make back that money. Some, you know, energy efficiency uh, uh, equipment is a good, ex another example, or, you know, requires regulation because even when things are in people's best interest, you know, we often have regulation to get people to switch away from, you know, incandescent light bulbs. Another reason is, Projects often take land or labor, and those are cheaper in global terms in low and middle income countries. And then also, you know, a lot of the future growth and in infrastructure and population is going to be in low and middle income countries. And if we were thinking about it's much cheaper to build green from the get go to say, I'm going to have passive cooling in a building or then uh, retrofit. And so a lot of those opportunities to build green are going to be in low and middle income countries. So I'll talk. As an example of a, a project of mine on in reducing deforestation in Uganda, so this is a you know deforestation is responsible for about ten percent of carbon emissions. It has very important private benefits for individuals. They're using that this money to pay for school fees, feed their families. They're doing that by using the land for agriculture or selling the trees. But these private benefits are very low in absolute global terms. Uh, and so, in a study with with colleagues, we evaluated, again, uh, paying people to keep their forests intact, you know, where the point of paying people is you, there's an arbitrage opportunity. These costs are very low in global terms. So in this case, the UN can fund fund this. So as, as a cheap way to, to mitigate climate change, but you don't want to make those poor landowners worse off. And so it's, uh, you know, kind of, it's, a, it's they have a, the option to participate if they think it's a better deal for them. So in 60 treatment villages, forest owners were offered $28 per hectare if they kept their forest intact. So most people were making from this program about $60 a year. And what did we find? We, you know, we found that in the control villages over two years, 9% of the forest was lost. So that's a huge, high, really high rate of deforestation. In the treatment villages, that was halved. You know, and it wasn't completely eliminated, but in some ways that's a nice feature. You know, some people said, no, this is $56, I'm going to be worse off economically if I take that up. So uh, they chose not to participate, but there was a, a you know, halving of deforestation. And I guess the real point here is not about the, the effectiveness, but the cost effectiveness. When we think about what was the benefit of that in terms of CO2 and the climate change damages, the benefits to the world are 15 times the cost. And here there's a nice comparison of what if we did the same thing in the US? And so the closest program in the US is the Conservation Reserve Program. And their evidence suggests that at least using standard social cost of carbon, the benefits there are less than the costs. So you don't even need to think about the absolute levels. You just need to know that doing it in Uganda is at least 15 times as cost effective as doing it in the US. Why? Because the value of the land is, is just lower in, in absolute terms. Um, you know, so what is needed to, to you know, I guess, the, so the idea here is that, well, there should be climate change mitigation in low and middle income countries, and it should be funded by richer countries. And so, What's needed to do this? We're, you know, I'm going to be very brief and high vague here, but you know, you, we need to strengthen the frameworks and mechanisms that allow credit towards a country's nationally determined contribution, what it promised under the Paris Agreement, that you can get credit not just uh, for what you do domestically, but for mitigation funded abroad. That's there in the Paris Agreement in principle, but it's not very fleshed out. I think a key for this to be credible and and actually do good is that you're you're not 
getting credit for things that are not actually removing carbon from the atmosphere. So you, know, you need monitoring and verification, which is partly a technical challenge, but it's also just about a credible market maker who is trying to get this right. I think another important piece of this is that you know, systematic quantification and documentation of the low and middle income countries co-benefits. Really, this is about gains from trade. This should be something where it's a cheaper way to mitigate climate change for, for say, the US government. But from the low and middle income countries, it's there's some real benefits of having this project take place there. This could be transfers of money, you know, could be local environmental co-benefits, uh, like particulate matter being reduced when you go from coal to cleaner energy. And I think you know maybe the last point I'll, I'll talk about in detail is, is, is I think it's important uh, to keep separate conceptually funding for mitigation in low and middle income countries where this is not about aid. This is, this is about a mutually beneficial trade between a high income country and a, and a low and middle income country, which is very different for our funding for adaptation, which is development assistance. And so, you know, I think I, one thing I worry about in, in, in trying to, you know, encourage more climate change mitigation in poor countries is I think it's a travesty that development aid is getting diverted to climate change uh, mitigation. And, and, you know, this, the amount you spend on a project in a low and middle income country, that's not uh, a transfer. Some of that money might be for material sourced elsewhere, like solar panels. And, you know, some of it is, uh, is what you really want to know is the surplus to the low and middle income country. And some of it, the money is offsetting opportunity costs. So I'll come back to my Uganda forest example, because I think if that makes it, it's an intuitive way to see it, which is you're paying people to keep the forest intact. So yes, you transfer money, but in some cases, you know, in many cases, they lost out on the money they would have made from agriculture or selling timber. And so what is this figure doing? It's showing you for people, the people on the left were the people who weren't going to cut their trees anyway. So these are people you paid and there was no environmental benefit because they were going to protect the environment anyway. And they actually hear the treatment group, they actually are better off economically. This is a self-reported economic well-being. The people on the right are the people who were gonna cut their trees except for this program. And they, so for the, this, these folks on the, in the, the dark blue bar, they're the ones where you got environmental benefits from them, but they had no change in their economic status. So you can't double count that you're asking someone to change their behavior, they're incurring opportunity costs. You can't double count that you got those uh, environmental benefits from them, you know, and that you transfer money to them. That transfer was just offsetting the opportunity costs. And so I think it's really important, you know, as we pursue this to, to actually, um, you know, kind of not overcount this as development aid. So, you know, the last case are the cases where I think it's, it's going to be hard to, to see progress uh, on the environment where, you know, it's, it's not a, there really is a, a deep trade-off. So I'm showing you an example from a study in China that used water monitoring to nicely show the trade-off when, when environmental regulations were enforced, firms had 24% lower total factor productivity. I don't know if that number is representative, but the point is that uh, firms operating in a cleaner way cost them, uh, they invested in capital and they were less profitable. So here, you know, this is, I, I'm not going to have any solutions here, here. And I think these are the challenges where, you know, protecting the environment for future generations is not something that is consistent with current citizens and politicians' discount rates. And so here, probably, you know, what we can the best hope for solving these environmental problems is probably growth and poverty reductions so that when people are richer, they're willing to sacrifice economically to pay to protect the environment. In some cases, maybe there's some external donor money that has more patience or that thinks uses a globally standardized value of a life. And so things that might not make sense domestically, uh, it's it can attract philanthropic money. I think it's important to you know study and quantify these environmental challenges because sometimes they would be important to solve today and we just don't know it because we haven't been documenting the harms. So just to you know, recap, I think there are some cases where uh, low and middle income countries should be and 
you know, want to protect the environment and are failing to do so, where, and I think strengthening state capacity and governments, and in some cases, lowering the cost of capital or what's needed. I think mitigating climate change in low and middle income countries is a great global bargain that should be funded by rich countries in a way that uh, also has net benefits for low and middle income countries. And I think the hardest cases are where uh, there aren't clear domestic benefits or global benefits economically. And so we're really just kind of caring about the environment per se. Uh, and they're, you know, probably economic progress will is the best way to increase the political support to put more emphasis on protecting the environment per se. Thank you, Seema. That was fantastic. I know there was a a lot of information there and a lot for people to think about. So I'm sure we'll have lots of questions. I certainly do. But before we uh, before we indulge ourselves to fire questions at you, I'm going to invite Rohini Semanathan to speak for about 15 minutes in response to your presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Ranil. Thanks a lot, Seema. That was really interesting. Um, at some level, when we think about environmental problems, they're daunting because they're just so complex. Uh, so many different things affect the environment. It's today's generations, future generations, things that people have done in the past. Uh, the ethical and the economic debates are really complex. Uh, on the other hand, it's also exciting because from an economist's point of view, there are just so many different ways to influence policy and figuring out what is the right way is a challenge. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the context of SEMA's um, air pollution examples and the residue burning, just to, just to illustrate uh, the complexity of the problem. And I really liked SEMA thinking about the, her taxonomy of the win-win, you know, the win globally and lose locally, uh, and then the global trade-offs. And I, I think what I'll do is talk a little bit about these win-win situations and what's why uh, an apparent win-win might not be a real win-win unless we actually change something on the ground. And so I'll give you a few examples from work that we've been doing in India in the last, you know, whatever, decade and a half. Um, so for, for the residue burning problem, um, there are so many different ways to influence policy. So one is, you know, of course, to have equipment that tills the residue back into the land. Then there are policies, and that's being done more now, which is buy the residue and then put it into, you know, the consumption of, of uh, fuel and power, other kinds of things. Um, then, of course, you could have fuel standards, you could have driving restrictions. Uh, one of the things that's not often thought about in this debate is one step removed. It's really trying to think about what food policy implications, what the implications of food policy are for the problem as a whole. So the areas in which we have a lot of burning today, there are two things that are different about them today from before. Uh, one is that rice wasn't grown traditionally in these belts. Uh, so there were wheat growing regions that then switched over to rice. This is Punjab and Haryana. And uh, what that did uh, was really created this very narrow window between the time that the rice crop had to be harvested and the wheat crop had to be planted. And uh, so then a lot of efforts that were actually made locally, like in uh, Punjab Agricultural University to develop equipment, imported equipment, uh, now the burning of residue, um, the, the buying of residue that would prevent its burning, it really all has to be scrunched in in this really small window. So you have to think of not only contracts that can work. It's not the overall capital cost, but it's really orchestrating something that will then spread this capital over many, many people over a very short period of time. And uh, so part of the cost that Seema mentioned of renting machinery really arises from these logistical problems that exist. And so the only case I'd make here is 
One is that we can't think of that problem just in terms of burn or not burn for the farmer. We have to think of all the complex gamut of issues that actually lead to the problem in the first place. So that includes the, the fact that rice is procured at subsidized rates and other grains are not, you know, that maybe would have been planted instead of rice. There's the cost of rice on the water table. Uh, you know, so there's this, there's the fact that wage rates in Punjab are really high compared to wage rates in Bihar. So even though you're growing rice in growth regions, in one case, you, you don't have to quickly switch into rice, but also the cost of labor is much lower. So you're not using these combine harvesters that are cutting just the top of the crop and leaving a lot of residue. And so the, the problem is just a lot more complex. And so even when we have a single cost and a benefit, these issues are difficult because, you know, how do you value human life? But here it becomes really difficult. The cost benefit analysis is vital, but it's really difficult because we're thinking about, um, about the overall policy that really then leads to particular cropping patterns and then that leads to particular problems. So, so policy is hard to come up with. Uh, there are many different angles. And so my the only point I differ with Seema on is, yes, it's great to strengthen governance, but it's also very hard to strengthen governance. So some of the time we might want to, when we're looking at these different policies, actually think about what it is in the incentive of the politicians and the policymakers to go for and what would look good to them. And I think with the residue uh, burning problem, we have to think hard on that. Um, another comment on this win-win is uh, what criterion should we use? So obviously, Economists usually think of the Pareto criterion. Are we all better off somewhere? And we decide win-wins on the basis of that. But obviously, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in if there was a Pareto allocation that was better. And so we really need to think then of the modified Pareto criterion, which is really do the benefits locally outweigh the costs. Uh, and that's that's clearly what, what Seema would have had in mind. Uh, the problem with that is we then need to think about mechanisms and instruments that can transfer or compensate the losers uh, for, and it might be small transfers that can make all the difference to actually turn this potential win-win into an actual win-win. And here maybe, um, I'll give you a few examples from work we've done. Um, so in 2001, in Delhi, we had, uh, we had legislation that switched public transport vehicles from uh, dirty fuels to relatively clean fuels. And in the case of Delhi, it was compressed natural gas. So all buses and auto rickshaws and taxis had to go over to what we call CNG. And it was relatively trouble-free. And uh, these changes were mandated for many Indian cities by the Supreme Court and by the state courts in different states. But they took a lot of uh, they took a lot of work to come into place. So there was a lot of resistance. And what uh, Parikshit Ghosh and I have been doing is looking at these changes in the city of Kolkata in West Bengal. And there was just, you know, mayhem. There were buses being burnt, there were protests, the unions got involved. And finally, change came about in 2010, 10 years roughly after what was happening in Delhi. And, uh, and then we started to ask why, you know, gas was cheaper. Uh, you know, there must have been some easy easy way of compensating for, for capital costs to actually bring this transition about. And so we started looking at this. And one of the things that really surprised us is that we found that owners of auto rickshaws were actually less resistant to the change than renters. And that made no sense to us because we thought, look, the problem has to be the capital costs. You know, why are these people objecting if the operating costs are lower? And we found a couple of things. One we found was that renters were paying much higher rents uh, after the change for these newly fitted auto rickshaws. The other thing we found <laughs> through a sort of roundabout uh, way, the other thing we found was that the renters were using much dirtier fuel. 
So they were using adulterated fuel because really they didn't have to bear the depreciation that took place on the vehicle. And so when we looked at the actual operating cost, marketed cost, and we looked at the actual cost, there was a big difference for renters. And so they weren't actually better off with the legislation. Um, the other thing we found was that uh, given the number of auto drivers you had in Calcutta, what you would have had to compensate them would have been trivial. Uh, and you could have easily done this with a small tax on registered vehicles. Just a small increase in registration fees would have done that easily. But the problem really was that there was no mechanism in place to get this transfer to happen. So I think the the um, the lesson for us there was when we think about policies, we really need to think about the instruments that will make transfers take place. Um, so that was one, one insight that I thought might be of interest uh, to this audience. Um, another couple of quick cases, um, and then I'll stop. Uh, the other example is from a recent paper we did on the temperature effects on climate change and what the effects of global warming are on productivity. And we did this using high frequency um, worker output data from a variety of firms. Again, we came across a very surprising finding, which is that we found that in garment workers, we found a significant decline in productivity. Maybe I can actually, actually show this to you. Um, Maybe I can show this to you here. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Uh, Ranil, can you yes, see yes, a screen? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, let me, oh, it's not here, sorry. Just totally, totally disorganized. I thought it was there, but it's not. Okay, so what we found was that with, with uh, garment workers in Delhi, we found a big decline in productivity. And then with workers in Surat who were actually weaving cloth, we found no decline in productivity. Now, this was a big puzzle for us because Surat is much hotter than uh, Delhi even is at that time. And we just found that it was the nature of the contract. So Surat workers were paid by peace rates. Uh, garment workers in Delhi were paid salaries per month. And so with peace rates, you really pushed yourself to keep productivity high. Uh, even though it might have had other kinds of effects on health. So one of the lessons for that was when you're looking at things like climate change, which are complex, you really need to figure out what the nature of the contract is. And you might not always, your estimates of what's going on might not capture the full impact of the change. Um, the, the last small example I want to give was from... Uh, what we did on shopping bag regulations in, in Delhi. So plastic shopping bags have been increasing, you know, exponentially across the world. A lot of European countries have come up with explicit pricing and they found it's worked. Uh, in Delhi, you've had bans and they've largely not worked. So we had a pricing experiment where we actually incentivized um, shopkeepers to charge for bags. And then we monitored what people did. And we found that it actually led to a big decline in shopping bags, okay? Then a ban comes along and there's an even bigger decline. And then a few weeks later, we're back to where we started. Uh, so I think these questions of governance really come in because whenever new regulation comes in, people worry about, look, is it going to be permanent? Is someone really going to come along and ask us to pay a fine and let's respond immediately? But then as soon as, you know, the whole nexus comes in where you can bribe officials to actually get around the regulation, these very, um, these very large uh, fines and these uh, very draconian bans actually don't seem to don't seem to work. So I suppose what I'm what I'm saying is that I do believe that there are lots of win wins. Um, I think they're a good thing to focus on because they don't uh, they don't really involve international climate negotiations of a kind that have been very fraught, uh, but actually translating the potential win-win to the actual win-win requires us really understanding local institutions and thinking of ways in which we can institute compensatory transfers 
And that's not as easy as it might seem. So those are my comments. Thank you very, very much, Rahini. That was fascinating. Um, Seema, before we I start sort of picking out questions from the audience, and actually a couple that Shanta has left for me to ask you, uh, is there anything that you'd like to respond to immediately in Rahini's uh, comments? Uh, no, I, 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 that was a great, Rahini, and I think we probably agree on uh, uh, a lot in the sense that, you know, I think, I think payments for ecosystem services is, you know, precisely trying to make people uh, not worse off by by this, but and and also kind of why I added tax capacity. You know, I think the example of the car tax in India in Delhi is like a, a good example where there already was a mechanism to tax, and you could have raised it, and then what was missing there was the way to make the transfer. But you know, that ability to tax and transfer seems key to to be able to. Yeah, not to to solve these problems without hurting people who, you know, like increasing inequality. Fantastic. There was so much for us to think about there. Um, but I do have a couple of questions in the chat already. And um, I'm probably going to give Shanta the very first uh, question, even in absentia. Um, but this will be... Um, but either of you, if you have anything to say about this, um, Shanta's point was that to get to scale in addressing most of these environmental externalities within developing countries, you more or less always need to go through the government. And there's a sort of essentially an assumption that with sufficient funding, the government will do the right thing. And this actually sort of links a little bit to Bernard Arite's, um question in the chat. Um, how do we actually incentivize governments to get to do the right thing? What if domestic, do we think domestic politics will point in the direction of addressing environmental externality or will sort of domestic interest groups um, stymie these efforts? And similarly, I mean, most of these governments have multiple challenges to face and limited attention and capacity. Where do we think this sits on their, um, on their agendas? I'll um, maybe go to Seema first and then Rahini. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm willing to defer to Rahini on 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 this one. Um, yeah, I think that um, the you know, so I, I mentioned kind of public awareness of the damages of of particulate matter as like you know kind of one of the constraints because you know I think if I see you know a path to to solving this problem and more government attention to solve this problem it's partly because you know it's it's kind of miserable to be in new delhi in certain months of the the year and if enough people uh you know kind of put pressure on the government for that or reward a government for solving it then i think that is valuable so that you know that's another way why where education or just having the luxury to care about air pollution versus you know basic needs is, is going to be part of what's needed to to solve some of these um yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I, I guess, uh, uh, yeah, I know, you know, will among other priorities, you know, again, I, you know, like solving the high level of air pollution in New Delhi has a pretty high benefit cost ratio, probably, you know, higher benefit cost ratio than some of the other things governments are prioritizing. So I guess it's, you know, making sure citizens realize that, you know, so that it's it's politically popular to put attention on this, even if you have to spend less time on, on something else. And then, you know, the ability to choose and enact the policies that can actually do it. So, yeah, so I guess I'm reasonably optimistic in cases that are as stark as the one, you know, we were focusing on, which is particulate matter in, in you know, very polluted cities like New Delhi. Rahini, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think I'd agree with Seema. Many cities in the world, Los Angeles, New York, have had serious air pollution problems in the past and they've overcome them. I think eventually we'll overcome the problem in Delhi. Um, but in terms of environment policy design, we've always had this, this, this cliche now of polluter pays. I always think of it as... as and, and I think, you know, I mean, as Coase pointed out many decades ago, that, you know, you really need to think about what's globally optimal because who, 
who the damage is on really depends on the, you know, how you think of damage depends on your particular property rights regime. And you really think about, you need to think about what's optimal outside the particular property rights regime that you have now. But I think the one thing that we should replace that, that principle with, because I don't know that it has a lot of content. I mean, we're all polluting and we're all paying in some sense, you know, in different ways. I think one thing we should replace it with when we're thinking about this legislation is that we do need to compensate losers. And I think this is one thing that Seema did emphasize at many stages, uh, you know, when she was talking about her own research. And if we did put that at the forefront, like I know with the auto drivers, uh, in Calcutta, it would have been really so easy, it would have been really so smooth to say that, look, let's do this and figure out uh, how much they lose and let's think of ways in which we can smooth that transition. But I want to emphasize that coming up with these cost benefit calculations is not trivial. And I think that's what makes the job of think tanks of academic researchers, this is not self-interested. It's just it's just that it is, there is a lot to do there uh, because you do need to zoom into the problem and really think about who all the actors are. But I think that we do need to compensate, otherwise we're not going to move forward. So I, um, I actually teach cost benefit analysis. Uh, just, just finished teaching it this last couple of weeks. And I couldn't agree more. Uh, cost benefit analysis is incredibly difficult, and even in government to do it quite well, like the UK government normally does it quite well, it's almost always incredibly flawed. And there's a double quest, uh, problem, which is that um, we also have limited mechanisms to actually act with, and the kind of things that we're, we're, we've all been talking about here involve a policy change, understanding a specific sort of problem and understanding its roots. But then also, when you add on to that the compensation mechanism, um, that sort of dramatically increases the complexity of it as a public policy. And uh, governments don't do complex things well, they do simple things well. Uh, that's one of the challenges that I think that we're, we're, we're going to face here. But I'd like to change tack slightly. And, Can I uh, say one thing on that, Ranil? I think that governments don't do complex things well when you're looking at centralized government. But I think if you actually had a lot more decentralized power, you would be doing things that are complex when you're looking at it from a global level because different local governments would be doing different things. But I think part of the problem with a country like India has been that we're extremely centralized. And so then you think of a one size fits all, but it actually doesn't. And then that's part of what goes wrong. Yeah, that's a great point, especially because at uh, lower levels, they have a lot more information. Um, so can I change the tag slightly and um, put a question to Seema to begin with on this. So the second chunk of your presentation was a lot about um, uh, that many of the cost effective, most cost effective um, ways of reducing carbon uh, globally will be found in low and middle income countries, which I think you're absolutely right on. But the, isn't the sort of actual global kind of maximization problem is not so much to minimize the cost per ton of carbon carbon emitted, but to minimize the cost of um, mitigating a certain minimum amount of carbon being emitted uh, over a certain minimum amount of time, in the sense that, so I suppose what I'm getting at here is that there are lots of things that we can do in low and middle income countries, but the biggest things are uh, the most concrete ones, which don't rely on um, on us understanding a counterfactual part of the carbon emission are going to be mainly in rich countries still. Um, so I'm just wondering like how, my worry is I suppose, um, is that the incentives for rich countries will be to pay for inconvenience and do things in low and middle income country, but to under provide the changes that they need to uh, undertake themselves which I kind of think is the equilibrium we're in here. And I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts on that, or if you think that there's absolutely no, there's, there's no need to choose one or the other, we can do both. Yeah, if I, let me see if I understand the, the um, question, which, uh, you know, which is that there's a, you know, there's like an easy way out by taking low cost things and we won't, you know, kind of accomplish enough if we take the easy way out. I don't, I think, in, um, you know, at some point you could still say, fine, we need to just think of this cost curve, the integral of the 
cost curve and how much mitigation we have has to be some target. And I guess the point is simply like, why, why don't we just to do that integral start on the left and 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 reach our target by by doing the cheapest things rather than just the domestic things and you know it's a it's a very trite point you know you know overly obvious point that the cheapest things aren't going to be what's within the U.S. government you know the U.S. borders as an example so um, but I think what you're saying is that like maybe we need some longer run investments so just take the you know Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S. and you know kind of uh, which is that's going to be a long-term play, right? So it's, it is, you know, that, so there is that investment and that's beneficial because, you know, as those technology materializes, that's going to be useful. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it's not probably delivering a lot of short run <laughs> reductions in, in um, carbon emissions. And so, yeah, I guess in terms of the Maybe I'm not completely understanding your question of like, are you are you wanting more like R and D, and you think this will crowd out R and D? Let me let, let me rephrase it because I probably wasn't very clear. I suppose my the simplest way of phrasing my question is that there's only enough carbon to make a big difference being emitted in the rich country, and so you could do a few cheap things that are small in poor countries, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, right. So I think in the short run, the the yeah, low and middle income countries are maybe some middle income countries are big emitters, but most uh, low income countries are not big emitters, you know, so the, the width of those bars, you know, how much mitigation you can accomplish is not going to be huge. If you and so you're not going to solve this problem by just focusing on low and middle income countries. And so I think that point is true. You know, you so it's not about completely shifting away from rich countries because like the intensity of carbon emissions is so much higher. I think where this, you know, quantitatively where this starts to change is if we and this gets into tricky and in about what are counterfactuals, if we say, you know, part of this is uh it's gonna be more expensive to build out elect electricity with clean energy than with coal in places that, you know, deserve to have energy as they grow. And if we count that as the counterfactual, you know, then, uh, you know, it's probably going to be cheaper to do that transition from coal to to renewables in I don't know uh, Chad or something, and you know, Uganda, uh, Kenya, and and play that out 10, 20 years, you know, that can quantitatively be large. So I think I'm agreeing with you that, that, yeah, this is not, as long as everybody still has to hit their NDC, you know, the U.S. is going to like be net, you know, net zero and net zero can't be just focusing on low and middle income countries, but I guess it just seems like uh, it's leaving money on the table by not picking off this low hanging fruit. Hey, do you want to add anything to that? I'm thinking particularly about the um, sort of the coal example because uh, you, I mean, India still burns quite a lot of coal, but there must be local negative externalities uh, involved in that too. Yeah, I mean that's one of the successes. There've been a lot of failures in India, but renewables has actually been a success. the The share of renewables has really gone up. Uh, there's still more coal than we probably should have, um, but. Uh, I was thinking of something else, Ranil, which is that one advantage of, of distributing the reductions in carbon um, is really this whole thing about local awareness and citizen awareness. I mean, when you think about changes, if they're really happening, if the US is reducing carbon emissions by really making transfers and investments somewhere else, I mean, one issue is what the one that you raised, which is ultimately they have to do more than that because they're big emitters of carbon. But there's the other issue that, you know, when you really do something local, how do you actually change social preferences? And I think that that's how you change them. We often take preferences as given, but what really matters for environmental change are changing preferences, which take the environment into account. And <laughs> This reminds me of this, this driving restriction experiment, like driving restrictions have not really worked anywhere to make a big difference in, in air quality or in congestion. I mean, they've had all sorts of perverse effects, whether you look at Mexico City or, you know, elsewhere. They bring eventually more cars on the road, older cars on the road, people get around them in all sorts of ways. But uh, it was interesting because when we had this odd even experiment in Delhi a few years ago, um, in 2016 was the first time the air was really bad. 
and you had a lot of citizen support for it. It was sort of amazing because it was clearly people were losing. They had to take different decisions. They were doing things and they were happy to do it. And I think, again, with a lot of these problems, I do feel that we underestimate the amount that people are going to be willing to pitch in if it's coordinated. They just don't want free riding. Um, and, you know, in the US, the things that would really make a difference, I think, are really going to be politically hard. I think we need to change the way cities are organized. We need to change public transport. It's been so hard to build that train in California. I mean, it's been incredibly hard. Uh, so I think that there are big things we could do. And if you did change them so that there was a culture of taking the train rather than driving in your car, if cars weren't just so intrinsic to people's self-worth, uh, things would start to change. But I think things need to change on the ground locally and people need to see those effects to actually think differently. And we can't just look at prices and where it's cheapest to limit carbon. Yeah, um, I think in the UK we're intimately familiar these days with how hard it is to build trains, um, given our given our recent public policy shambles. Um, so we've got a question in the chat from uh, Bart Adis, who's a professor of um, international development in McGill University, and um, I'm going to read it out because I'm not sure I. Um, so it's he says. What do you believe the prospects are for creating and scaling up natural, natural asset corporations whose primary purpose is to actively manage, maintain, restore, and expand nat natural assets and the, their production of ecosystem services? Um, there's more to the question there, um, but if, I don't know if either of you are familiar with the idea of national natural asset corporations, um, but um, I think the broad idea here is that these are essentially uh, how would they call it? Guardians um, of uh, guardians of nat na uh, natural assets um, owned um, at the national level, and uh, the it's sort of I think the mechanism is essentially to internalize some of the externalities from their depletion. Um, do you think that that's got any legs to it at all, Seema? Yeah, I'm not that uh, familiar enough to to speak intelligently on this. So I, you know, I think the. Um, yeah, I think kind of putting the value of environmental benefits into to you know call, dollar terms and thinking about it as capital is you know is useful useful because it helps with cost benefit analyses. We can you know you know being able to say protecting the forests, estimates of the social damages from carbon, et cetera. You know that I think that's really useful for helping pol motivating policy movement and, and deciding between policy options. I guess you know in some of the cases, the you know, sometimes protecting the environment still is going to require some, you know, except through carbon markets where you could actually kind of monetize this. It's it's like philanthropic, a lot of environmental protection, you know, protecting coastlines, et cetera. Like that's still we're in a world where we could something somebody needs to inject money to to solve that problem. And so, yeah, I guess I would say that the organizing structure if I'm understanding it correctly, makes sense. I think in lots of cases where there's not a clear tie to climate change, there's still going to be the challenge of, of you know, who finances, who finances it. I also make one comment about the social preferences, et cetera, which is, um, I, you know, I doubt this is a big disagreement um, with what Rohini what said of, you know, people kind of, as they get more awareness, like they're willing to, to sacrifice. I think, you know, what I've noticed that when I present my work on forests in Uganda, like lots of people say they don't like the idea, you know, that's an idea that you pay people for perpetuity, you know, they're keeping carbon sequestered, and you keep paying them $50 a year. And people don't like lots of people don't like perpetual solutions like that. And maybe it's a temporary solution till we, you know, figure out how to, whatever, put inject carbon into the, you know, underground, but um, some carbon capture, but, but the reason I, I always push back. People always say like, oh, why, why don't you instead try to convince people to care about the forest or care about the environment? I think that's just like a really, I, I bristle at that in the context of very poor people, you know, especially when there's a global externality. So, you know, in that case, like trying to convince it, someone in Uganda to not cut their trees because it's good for the environment is like really sort of asking them to give up some money for, you know, a meal that day for their kids to help 
me, you know, it's like a, and, and lots of people globally. So I guess in terms of like shifting preferences, I feel like we should start with rich people on shifting preferences and for poorer people, like, you know, cause shifting preferences, it's, you know, I don't know that we've really made them, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that like, uh, they've really kind of care, get so many, you, so much utility from protecting the environment that compensates them really offsets the material loss in some cases. Yeah, I think that's kind of like the almost the sort of Michael Sandel kind of um, uh, objection to paying for paying for things that we should that maybe other people might think that we should think are just intrinsically good. And um, I think even Samuel Balls has got this it's on the bookshelf behind me, this book, The Moral Economy, where he talks about um, how using high powered incentives like that can sort of also negatively change people's um, Social preferences, but I mean, like you make the obvious objection to those problems, which is that if we're asking people to make meaningful, substantial, material sacrifices, it's somehow also morally quite wrong to not compensate them for it, and uh, probably much more powerful if we do. Um, At least if they're poor. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, quite right. Um, uh, particularly if there's some some sort of sense of like a a transfer from them to us which seems really sort of, this is, it's a little bit of how this works. Um, so there's one more question in the chat that I quite just, like to- Just to clarify, Ranil, I mean, I don't think I'm thinking of this in terms of cross-continental transfers. It was more, you know, how do you get people to feel that, look, we can really have a reasonable public transport system in LA as opposed to, you know, what we, a bunch of highways, and often it's very hard for people to see alternatives that involve large infrastructural investments. And um, so that's that's more, more what I meant. It's not really a cross-community thing. It's really a within-community thing um, that I was thinking of. One, one thought on this, I don't know whether this is what's meant by a national asset corporation at all, but I think what Norway has done about its oil revenues has been pretty incredible, I think. And so people have really seen the benefits in terms of long-term planning for social transfers by actually managing natural resources through an organized structure and it's fed into their retirement plans and other things. So I think of that as a big success story. Um, I don't know if that's related, but I just thought I'd throw it out since I don't know what else national asset corporations do. No, okay. um, so I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on this. So um, <laughs> I couldn't correct, I couldn't correct, uh, correct uh, I, I can't quite comment. Um, I think what you just said also sort of, um, Relate back to something Seema said earlier on in her presentation, which is that sometimes there's a we have bounded imagination of the possibility of um, public policy options that are out there. And I think um, as someone who's got around 20 years of experience working in government, it's one of the things that uh, constantly struck me is that there are there are answers, but they're just very different answers to the type that we're exactly. used to giving. And the mental barrier, the cognitive load to get people over the bar there is really high. And I mean, part of that is um, almost rational resistance by politicians because it's hard to explain very new ideas to people. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give an example. Just I wanted to uh, realize I wanted to make a point about Rohini, you mentioned that in the crop burning, you know, it's, it's, um, partly because of the two cropping system that's now in, you know, rice and, Punjab and Haryana, you know, part of it is also, uh, you know, kind of by two environmental regulations hitting butting heads, right? So that there's restrictions on when you can plant rice to protect groundwater. And so now everybody is synchronized and, and wants to use the equipment in the same week. And so, you know, kind of like I've thrown out the idea of like, you know, maybe we should stagger kind of like the even odd days, we should stagger when people can plant rice because, you know, we sort of overcorrected, over-indexed on the groundwater problem and it's exacerbated the pollution problem. But, but this idea, you know, it just seems like so weird to people when I say like, you know, some people can plant earlier and some people can still the old regulation, you know, I, I think it's just an example of what seems very intuitive as a, you know, from an economist point of view of like, it's not optimal to have a corner solution policy. Also, 
Yeah, but also you could stop paying the what you pay for rice. <laughs> yeah, no, no, exactly. No, you could not have it. No, no, right. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you as well that you know that you you're you're subsidizing, you're over encouraging people to grow a crop yeah. that's not suited for it, et cetera. Yeah, no, no, but there are lots of other, you know, other things that could play into this. Um, but I think they're yeah, it's uh, yeah, the wacky ideas, um, or you know, kind of think I think what things seem maybe not obvious, but sort of logical to economists sound wacky to, to policymakers. And so part of our goal is, is like normalizing, you know, I think, you know, Michael Kramer's advanced market commitments, you know, Rachel Gunnister's, like, you know, there are examples where kind of wacky ideas get take up, uh, but we probably need to do more of that. Yeah, we need a really good set of studies about what it is about the wacky ideas that get taken up and how they're communicated and who communicates them. Because, yeah, I, I, I agree with you both enormously. There are wacky but obvious kind of things that we should be doing that would dramatically improve human welfare. We well, and even if they're not, Ranil, the thing is having the wacky idea out there can really help people come up with something that they like. But at least it it gives them something to think about. Look, you know, this would be natural in this case. So if you don't want it, you know, move towards it in something that you think is more natural. So I no, think carbon, that's where the... carbon taxes are are kind of playing that role as a a benchmark, right? You know, like we're not having carbon taxes, but it helps us, you know, see about the efficiency gains. Well, Sweden's carbon. having carbon taxes. Yeah. So, so the thing is that things that might seem wacky, and this is, I think, an interesting debate, is that why is it that something seems so wacky in a context where in another they just are there, they're part of policy, you know? And uh, I think that's where these kinds of discussions are, are useful. It's, it's why are they beyond the realm of imagination in some places and yeah. actually on the ground in others, yeah. I, I would love to keep continuing the conversation, but we've just run, overrun by a couple of minutes already, and uh, we've taken up so much of everybody's time already. So that was fantastic. Thank you both so much. Um, I learned I learned a huge amount. I'm sure all of our attendees did. And thank you so much for your, the time you take in in preparing your comments and your slides, and also the time you take in to respond to our questions. Um, and for everybody else, um, just keep your eyes on the Center for Global Development in Georgetown's Twitter feeds, and you'll see when we're able to announce the next of our next in our series. So thank you very much.